Welcome to the IPA webinar, Psychoanalytic Emotional Support in Times of War. In recent months, we have witnessed the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine. But even before this latest war, we have witnessed the devastating consequences of armed conflicts in multiple regions around the world. Our newspapers and TV screens bring us images of villages and cities destroyed and refugees fleeing for their lives. At the same time, soldiers that fight these wars are left traumatized by death, carnage, and suffering, and sometimes by the atrocities they have witnessed or participated in. Psychoanal psychoanalysts, with their understanding of trauma, child development, the unconscious, and the importance of listening, have much to offer by way of intervention and understanding of the psychic cost of war. Our three speakers today, Harold Kudler, Pilar Gavilano, and Marianne lutzinger bolobe have all been active in efforts to employ psychoanalytic knowledge and skills to the design and implementation of interventions aimed at providing emotional support to the people suffering the calamity of war. Today, we have the opportunity to learn from their experiences and research in our ongoing efforts as psychoanalysts to offer what aid and comfort we can in these ongoing crises. Before handing over the presentation to our panelists, I will briefly explain the format of how this webinar will function. It has two sections. In the first section, each of our two panelists will give a seven to 10 minute presentation. The second session is a question and answer portion devoted to the free exchange of selected questions and ideas with the panelists and attendees. You will find a questions box on the right side of the screen. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in this box. You can post your questions throughout the whole course of the webinar from the beginning. Please remember that questions will not be answered until all three presentations from the panelists have completed. Now we're ready to begin. Our first presenter is Dr. Harold Kudler, who will speak to us on psychoanalytic thoughts on war and warriors. Dr. Kudler is Associate Consulting Professor at Duke University and Adjunct Professor at the United States Uniformed Services University. He co-led the development of the joint U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs and Department of Defense Guidelines for the Management of Post-Traumatic Stress and served as Chief Consultant for Mental Health for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. He's president of the Psychoanalytic Center of the Carolinas and co-chairs the Service Members and Veterans Initiative of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cutler, and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Well, a line from Shakespeare's King Lear that's always stuck with me goes like this. The worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. Uh, in over 40 years of treating combat veterans, ex-prisoners of war, and their families, uh, I've come to realize that as many times as I've thought, this is the worst war story that anyone has ever shared with me, that I'm bound to hear another, which is even worse. And psychotherapists, a good deal of our thought and energy goes into trying to understand what trauma is and what it is we can do about it. But I think our greatest challenge is simply being in the room with trauma survivors while maintaining our ability to function as therapists. This lesson from the warriors who have trusted me over the years is core to what I want to share with you today. Psychoanalysis had its beginnings in the radical idea that mental disorders spring or can spring from traumatic events. As Breuer and Freud wrote in 1895, their patients suffered mainly from reminiscences, traumatic memories. Uh, specifically, they said 
Psychical trauma, or more precisely, the memory of trauma, and I want to emphasize it's the memory of trauma, acts as a foreign body, which long after its entry may continue to be regarded as an agent that is still at work. In other words, traumatic memory uh, serves as a vector of disease, much like a germ within its host. The idea that a mental process could itself be pathogenic was the beginning of modern clinical psychotherapy, and it continues to serve as the bedrock of psychoanalytic uh, approaches to disorders of traumatic stress. Uh, the point I want to emphasize today is that what Breuer and Freud were saying in 1895 tells us that psychic trauma doesn't only exist in the past. A lot of other therapies say, well, that's the past. How do we get rid of a memory? How do we deal with the past? But the analytic perspective, I think, is that it continues to exist as an agent still at work today, which means it's alive in the consulting room between patient and therapist. That idea is uniquely psychoanalytic, and it's essential to successful therapy with all trauma survivors, no matter what kind of treatment you think you're applying. I think that's an essential operational principle. Freud's ultimate understanding of psychological trauma progressively deepened in the aftermath of World War I and the 1918 pandemic, stressors that resonate very closely with our experience today. In works such as Notes uh, for Our Times on War and Death, on Narcissism, Mourning and Melancholia, and Beyond the Pleasure Principle, all major works written either during or in the immediate aftermath of uh, World War I, Freud evolved an understanding of how overwhelming events disrupt established structures and functions of the mind, uh, including a breach of what he came to call the stimulus barrier. What's less often emphasized is that Freud's writings all tend to describe how mental structures and functions have been forged in the crucible of interpersonal relationships, starting with the earliest parental relationships. You know, object relations creeps in all the way through Freud's thought, but it really takes center stage, I think, in Morning and Melancholia. And then there's a straight line from there uh, right to the ego and the it and the, de the development of the new structural model. That's actually one of Strachey's observations that's always stuck with me. The same line of thought led Freud to propound a new structural theory in the ego and the id, which among other things uh, points out that the superego is actually an internalization of the parents, uh, of their qualities and functions, which then become an integrated seamless part of the child's psyche. One way to think about psychological trauma is that the horrors of war uproot core elements of the psyche established in normal development. And that in turn corrupts faith in oneself, in the world, in the future, and in any hope of attaining the ego ideal, any hope of being worthy of love, any hope of attaining what people strive for their whole lives, to belong, to be a part of something, uh, and, and to hold it and be held. Because of this, survivors of war have difficulty establishing basic trust in the therapeutic relationship, which leads to complexities of transference and countertransference more severe than one usually encounters uh, with, uh, with, with your average patient. Uh, traumatic stressors live in the therapeutic relationship. They're even fed by it, I think, in the effort to create that relationship. It, it, it actually speaks to these issues and it calls them forward. And it does that with such intensity that the therapist may be exposed to trauma as a vector. We talk about vicarious traumatization, secondary traumatization. And this is happening in the relationship. Um, and the therapist may feel that so strongly that they themselves bring it home at the end of the day in lots of ways. It may manifest as feelings of fear, anxiety, revulsion, incompetence, hopelessness. Uh, Sarah Haley's article, When the Patient Reports Atrocities, written uh, during her work as a social worker uh, working with Vietnam veterans early on uh, in the years after the Vietnam War ended, is, is a wonderful uh, text uh, to study about this. 
the therapist may themselves become tortured by doubt about whether things is, are, uh, this therapy is ever going to work. They may even wonder why they ever thought they could be therapists in the first place. I think in the end, both patient and therapist will need to prove good enough to take Winnicott's term, to tolerate, manage, and ultimately work through the fundamental challenges of psychological trauma. That doesn't mean to master the trauma. It means to be good enough to remain in the room with it and survive it together. The fundamental goal of therapy with combat veterans could be described as the reestablishment of basic trust. What Jerome Frank, who served as an army psychiatrist in World War uh, II, called the remoralization of the survivor, but, but it's also the remoralization of the clinician. We're talking about trust in oneself, trust in other people, trust in the world around. In a very real sense, therapy recapitulates developmental steps which produce the stimulus barrier in the first place. And I say that as a shorthand. Uh, because I've always thought that Winnicott's thoughts about the holding environment and how it's established in transitional space provides a good way of understanding what the stimulus barrier is and where it comes from, how it provides the possibility of resilience in a world that isn't always safe or supportive. It always has to be remembered that therapy can't change the past or make a bad thing into a good thing. I worry a great deal about psychedelic psychotherapy for PTSD, this idea that somehow you can make everything all right. Uh, I don't think it's going to be all right. And I worry about doing magic when one ought to be doing therapy. Maybe we can talk about that later. What psychoanalytic therapy can do is remobilize healthy developmental lines, leading to a new state of balance, not the old state, but a new state internally, with others and with the world around. The past cannot be changed, but both external and internal worlds can be healed. And the place where that healing begins is within the therapeutic relationship. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot there that we'd love to know more. Um, our next speaker is Pilar Gavilano. And she will speak to us on experiences of psychoanalytic intervention in times of crisis. Uh, Pilar Gavilano is a member of the Peruvian Society of Psychoanalysis. She has taught at the Graduate School of the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, as well as teaching at the Peruvian Society of Psychoanalysis, where she's currently president. She created and organized the emotional support line that has been in operation since the start of the pandemic. Uh, welcome, uh, Pilar, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. I really thank this opportunity because the Peru so uh, Psychoanalytic Society has been long engaged in uh, efforts to work in the community especially in difficult situations such as the ones we're living today. Uh, profiting from Harold's basic uh, framework, I will focus on more concrete experiences that we have. Uh, I will briefly summarize four experiences. I will extend myself a little bit longer uh, in the one I have uh, help to create and develop. And lately, if I have time enough, uh, I will offer some insights uh, from a meeting of the colleagues that uh, have uh, participated in these experiences that we we helped, especially for this webinar. So I hope that this will be useful. As I start uh, relating the experiences, you will immediately start uh, finding out that there are similarities and differences with what we're going through today. But you will see that things can be picked out that can be useful, usefully applied now. So I will start. First of all, I would like to thank my colleagues, Elsa Leon, Pilar Raffo, Maria del Carmen Raffo, Viviana Valsgen, Ines Santisteban, Maria Elena de Marini, Maria Pia Costa, and Cecilia Martinez. 
the CDA is our link to base. So any anything you think that might be useful for you, she can provide. Mm -hmm. So um, the first experience I'm going to report is that one of emotional support and treatment of victims of the internal armed conflict in Peru. You may have heard about the Shining Path. It's a terrorist group that started an internal war in Peru between 1980 and 2000. Peru suffered greatly uh, because of this attack, but also because of the answer of the Peruvian authorities. Uh, not yet, please, uh, uh, Matthew. I'll tell you when, when to put that image. Um, the number of total victims estimated is around 69,300, uh, something like that. And the most affected people were poor peasants of the Andes and, and jungle. Many of them were very poorly educated and they spoke uh, native languages. Ma many of them didn't speak Spanish well. So you can imagine uh, the situation where they were trapped uh, between two fires, the, the fires of the, of the senderistas and of the, of the state. And they had to suffer massacres, not as sophisticated as bombs as, as we see now, but with even machetes and something like that. Uh, very large groups were killed. And then they were accused uh, of being collaborators to the terrorists and then being accused of being collaborators to, to the repressive forces. So we were really trapped. They, they have suffered you can have no idea how much they have suffered. So, uh, and many had to flee their, their original homes and come to larger countries to settle as refugees. So my colleagues uh, started working very long ago. I, uh, well, let me see when. Since 1994 with those victims. Uh, they have uh, given them emotional support and treatment uh, directed to, to children, adults, people in jail, people unjustly incarcerated, even terrorists in jail. They have uh, accompanied them to testify in front of the Truth Commission. They have been present in the openings of massive graves. They, they really know they have a lot of experience, and uh, you, you you may see that there is a differences the uh, difference between that war and this war. But there are possible similarities. Um, for example, cultural differences are obvious, but uh, it is interesting that uh, the war was between similar uh, groups of people. So it is an inside war. But uh, I, I would say that now, the, the present war we're talking about, there are also similarities because uh, there are people with a shared history and they're in some ways similar, in some ways different. They, they have to point out the, the differences uh, in order to justify attacks and war. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have... Uh, reflected about uh, some psychoanalytic authors dwelling in the, in the areas of, uh, of violence, political violence, etc. I, I would say Dr. Jonathan Sklar, I would say Dr. Bami Falcon, that are very useful for elaboration of these things. Okay, so th then I will move on to the next one. Um, the next one is called Psicologos Contigo. This is an experience that was uh, organized and led by former uh, SPP president Maria Pia Costa, uh, that was awarded the president's uh, award uh, in to, I, I don't remember the, the number of the London Congress, but uh, it, it was in response of the floodings of El Niño Costero phenomenon 
you know, the Peruvian coast is the desert most of the times. But every seven to eight years, something changes in the in the currents in the sea, and then large evaporation starts and intensive rains and floodings. People, poor people, settle in the way where the floodings go. They forget that this is going to happen again. So when it happens again, they are swept away by by water and mud and rocks. So uh, this happened uh, in uh, in twelve seventeen. And uh, Maria Pia organized a, a, a large group of uh, colleagues of our society, but also convocated other institutions that are psychoanalytically oriented. That is why, why it is called Psicologo Contigo and not psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst Contigo. But uh, it was a, an, an immense force. Uh, and uh, they, they went directly to work in populations that had suffered the loss of almost everything, not only material, but uh, lost uh, uh, family relations and social social bonds. And, and they, well, it, it, it was very, very important. If you need to find some extra information, it can be found also. Uh, a special attention was paid to children because in these times, uh, children are more vulnerable to abuse, sexual abuse, violence, etc. So they work very much with children. Plus, uh, they used a, a material. Uh, Matthew, you can share share the booklet now. That uh, is an adaptation of the booklet that Mercy Forbes um, produced, and I understand that you have similar. Uh, a similar material now at disposal of the IPA members or whoever who need it. Uh, it proved very useful. Only it is for children that can already read and draw and write. So there is a second uh, uh, initiative to develop another uh, material for for small children that would use finger puppets to uh, recreate the situation story and el elaborate a, a potentially traumatic experience. Something that we, we would like to point out is that not necessarily these uh, experiences will be traumatic. They are disrupted very, but uh, if we intervene timely, maybe we can prevent them from becoming traumatic. So in, this is in, in that line, and the next experience I'm going to show is also. Thank you, Matthew. OK, uh, uh, the next one uh, is, uh, let me see what I think here. Yeah. The SUNO project, Z-U-N-O. This is a group of colleagues of ours who have been working for almost 20 years uh, with workers that attend victims of domestic violence in Peru. You know, our country has terrible uh, numbers regarding domestic violence. Almost every day, one or two feminicides are reported. It, it is terrible. And uh, access to services is very scarce in areas that are remote in, uh, in Peru. Ours is a very complicated geography. Ours is a very, very centralized society. So most of the services are in large cities, especially in Lima, of course, but also in other large cities. But it is very difficult to access uh, remote populations. So there are, there are uh, teams of, of workers that. Uh, social workers, for example, that have to receive the, 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 the report
reports of uh, abuse and uh, sometimes they can solve the, the problem right away sometimes they have to help the victims find legal uh, protection and material protection and everything and they have to travel for that it is very difficult and very frustrating for them so what this zuno team does is help the helpers they organize the them in uh, with the technique of operative groups uh, developed by enrique pichon rivier who you may know the swiss argentine uh, psychoanalyst one of the founders of the apa and um well these uh, spaces that are, they are task groups start by uh, elaborating the group anxieties. It, it, uh, it is based on, on Beyond's ideas about groups, but it is very specific technique. And uh, it, it seems it is very, very useful for them. But uh, one thing that my colleagues want me to point out is that to do such a work, teamwork, is paramount and every uh, intervention that they do has to be discussed in, in groups so supervised etc because uh, also uh, our colleagues get involved on traumatized by the idea that's it next one is the emotional support line uh, in march 2020 the covid 19 epidemic hit peru uh, the, the government's in immediate response was to order lockdown. So nobody could get out of their homes. Every business and uh, public place was closed. Uh, only one member per, uh, per family was allowed to go out to buy food or medicine. And that was initially supposed to, to last for two weeks. Then it, it uh, ended lasting 100 days. So uh, people that were, for example, out of their homes in traveling wouldn't be able to go back home. People that were at home were isolated. But poor people that have uh, very poor uh, living conditions uh, had, had to live together in very small spaces. Moreover, they don't even have uh, basic services such as, as water or sanitation, let alone electricity, so they couldn't buy uh, enough food and store it so as not to have to go out again uh, many people lost their their sources of income because we have people so poor in peru that they have to work every day to get the, the money they need to support their families and um, so um what we did very 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 fast i don't know how we did it so fast we organized the support line that uh, um, we, we put uh, uh, in, in our um, website and social media uh, a formulary that people could fill. It was uh, it was anonymous. It was confidential and it was free, of course. So they they put their names. They put a phone number or an email address. And uh, some of our volunteers would call them back or write them back and set an appointment and have uh, with them one maximum two conversations that would last anything from a quarter of hour to uh, 45 minutes it was incredible you know the, the first thing we noticed was uh, how people were surprised that we called them in our sister society where uh, people are uh, accustomed not to have any any kind of response by anyone and uh, the importance of listening to them and helping them uh, organize what they are what they were saying maybe pointing out how how what was happening was linked to some prior experiences they they talked about um uh, helped very much first to lower anxiety and second to recuperate uh, the, the, their coping uh, capacities that have been disrupted by the experience 
Firstly, uh, anxieties were about being alone, lockdown, uh, fears of contagion. Vaccines in Peru didn't come until very, very much uh, later. We have the, the highest rate of deaths per 100,000 uh, people in the world. So you can imagine. Uh, the images in, in front of the hospitals were terrible. You saw, saw the patients queuing and dying in the, in the queues because there was no enough capacity for beds uh, or for oxygen. Even. So it, it was very, very, very difficult, traumatic experience. In the second, in the second moment, uh, the problem was that people already had losses in their families. So. Uh, Morning processes were very difficult to to start. Once a patient got into a hospital, you never saw him again because they gave you a box with ashes. You didn't, you couldn't uh, make a proper funeral. So um, uh, some of our uh, allies of psychology, Contigo, the other experiences uh, I talked about, they they helped us develop some kind of rituals, you know. Something that could authorize and set a stick uh, on the, 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 the morning processes. Um, well, this uh, the, the line closed when the, the pan, uh, when the lockdown finished. But after a, a careful evaluation, we decided that we could go on having it. So it's it's. Continuing and the present, but of, of course, uh, motives of uh, consultation have changed. Uh, th there are many less uh, demands and many less volunteers that want to, to attend them. I, I think we've suffered very severely the burnout. We attended almost 3,000 people. And uh, well, let's see what happens next. But I, I hope we, we can recover of that and continue working. We didn't have enough time really to make what my colleagues of SUNO advise, that is having spaces to discuss what we have heard. I remember myself uh, listening to, to a lady that uh, she went away from her home shopping while her son suffered a uh, uh, stroke and aneurysm, I think. He was taken to the hospital where he died. He never could see him again because it was not allowed to get into the hospitals. Y you have no idea. I have never cried for any patient like that. I cried for days. So, uh, never, not even for anyone in my family, you know. It was a very terrible experience. And uh, well, finally, I had to refer her to someone else to treat with her. Uh, it was devastating. Um, now, what else about this? Ah, we, we uh, developed a very specific uh, uh, set of guidelines for intervention that I think are very useful. And we are willing to share it when, with whoever wants it. If you want to set up uh, uh, an emotional support line or hotline, uh, I don't know how we did it because we we, we wrote them overnight. But uh, somehow I, I think uh, when you're in front of uh, such terrible conditions, somehow the best of you comes out and you can produce something that you don't know you. We didn't know we had that, you know, but but uh, I like them very much. Uh, well, the purpose of the intervention was to, it, it is a crisis intervention, an emergency intervention, where you can help people recover at least the prior state uh, they had before the, the, the crisis. Uh, some are complicated, had, had to be referred to, to health to mental health institutions with the uh, complication that many of them were closed and weren't taking any, any patients. So um, there are uh, something that the, the Ministry of Health has developed that are the 
community mental health centers. So we had to refer our, our complicated cases to them. And they either at the, uh, saw them physically or by, by phone or by Zoom, whatever. Uh, we had previously de decided that uh, our our we would we would consider doctors, nurses, social workers, policemen by by IP persons for our list. Well, that couldn't happen because they were so taken and so overwhelmed by the, by their jobs that they didn't have the time to stop and talk an hour with us. So, uh, and uh, we decided to do something different. We uh, decided to support their works at the, at the community mental health centers. Pilar, and, uh, uh, Pilar am I too long? Well, we have to we have to give uh, Marianne uh, some a chance to be able Thank to. Thank you. So. Uh, our next speaker is Marianne Lutzinger Bolliger, who will speak to us on psychoanalytic offers for traumatized refugees. She was the director of the Sigmund Freud Institute in Frankfurt, Germany, from 2001 to 2016. She's Professor Emeritus at the University of Kassel and is now Senior Professor at the University of Medicine and in Mainz. She is a Robert S. Wallerstein Fellow. She's a training and supervising analyst at the German Psychoanalytic Association and a member of the IPA Subcommittee for Migration and Refugees. Welcome, Marianne, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I hope that I can add some uh, perspectives for discussion because uh, I love that Harold introduced us to the psychoanalytic, real psychoanalytic thinking of coping with trauma already, for instance, in contrast to using drugs to, to forget about trauma. And uh, I am so admiring what you are doing in Peru as a, a psychoanalytic society. So uh, very shortly, I just want to remind us that this is not so usual that psychoanalytic societies are supporting colleagues who are committed. So I first would like just to add some thoughts on that and then perhaps give, us, uh, give you some ideas what we are doing. Many of us here in Europe are sleeping badly these weeks. The images of Mariupol of 2,000 trapped, starving civilians and soldiers in a bombed steel plant, of children and pregnant women being carried from Berwick Hospital, of mass graves and Russian missiles that could only also carry nuclear weapons 5,000 kilo kilometers away, all this haunts us in nightmares. For all the psychoanalysts in Europe, these images are often mixed with embodied memories of their own traumatization as young children in World War II. And finally, we are often thinking of our broad psychoanalytic knowledge that the wounds after man-made disaster never really heal and continue to weigh heavily on lives of those affected as well as their children and grandchildren for decades afterwards. All this is very difficult to cope with psychically. Hence, many of us have the desire to be able to do something meaningful in these weeks. That's the desire to help the refugees from the Ukraine serve primarily as a defense against unbearable feelings of helplessness, shame, and guilt. In the history of psychoanalysis, the presumption of such motives has led to a deep skepticism and reservation against colleagues who are immediately engaged and active during societal crisis, sometimes openly, sometimes in a rather hidden form. Following Freud's statements in his correspondence with Albert Einstein, Why War, for instance, it was implied that the so-called good doers, the gut menschen in German, who clearly side with the victims, perform a split in the sense of defending their own intolerable destructiveness, which poses a threat both to their own development and to civilization as well. 
look for the Putin in yourself first before you side with the victims. We could hear in some analytic commentaries in the recent weeks. Indeed, the confrontation with our own destructiveness is, as Freud postulated, flushed to the surface in times of war in the external reality and inevitably activates and mobilizes analog impulses in all of us in a very irritating and disturbing way, and then threatens our own sublimation and transformations of our destructive impulses and fantasies. This topic remains probably the most important contribution that psychoanalysis can bring both to societal discourses and to clinical work with traumatized persons and their helpers in supervision and applied psychoanalytical project. In the meantime, we can refer to many excellent psychoanalytic papers that have further elaborated Freud's view that unfortunately, the progress of civilization has only a very thin skin. Barbarism can break out again at any time and relatively easily. However, I would like to share with you some thoughts which are very much on my mind in the last weeks. Is it not a reduction of complexities if we exclusively look at this aspect of psychoanalytic engagement in societal crisis of war, trauma and persecution? I can only mention one example because I have to be very short. Mark Solms has revised and further developed Freud's drive theory with reference to recent neuroscientific research, particularly from the laboratory of Jörg Panksepp. He speaks of seven basic human affects, which can be seen connected to what Freud defines as drives. He talks about sexual drives, fear, anger, rage, sadness, curiosity, but also the urge to play as well as the caring behavior. Caring ensures our advancement as a species, namely because caring, nurturing and protecting our children was and still is an advantage in evolution. Mark Solms illustrated this thesis with a photo of a primate monkey protectively holding a baby of a German shepherd in his arms. When we see pictures from destroyed Ukrainian cities with injured or murdered children, women and men, the caring system is reactivated in all of us. The desire to help the desperate, helpless people in the Ukraine, only a few hundred kilometers from us here in Germany, to protect them, to comfort them. Maybe this is not only sentimentality, idealism or reaction formation, but corresponds to another basic need of all of us humans, a counterbalance to the terrible destructiveness of humans, which we as psychoanalysts know as well in our daily clinical work. I would like to discuss these thoughts with you because these are a different view. And I think the Peruvian uh, society and the colleagues have just given an example as you did, uh, Harold. The fact is that many psychoanalytic colleagues have been spontaneously and intensively engaged in the current political crisis and in the treatment of traumatized refugees. I can happily talk about it in more detail. I will only mention just a few lines First, many colleagues are involved in interdisciplinary dialogues with historians, political scientists, economists in the media and public events at the moment in order to contribute to their unique psychoanalytic expertise on unconscious dimension of human behavior to understand together why the world, at least in Europe, has changed so dramatically in the last weeks and has not to deny these realities and connect the dangers any further. B, in cooperation with the current administration of the German Psychoanalytic Association and the IPA Subcommittee for Migration and Research, Chair is Gertraud Schlesinger Kitt, we are establishing a network of all initiatives which have already been started in the 12 local institutes of our society. We want to make a documentation in order to know from each other, to support each other and to appreciate each other what we are trying to do and also share what uh, Harold you told within the counter-transference to cope with the extreme helplessness and not being over flooded by 
the, the, the trauma, to be kind of re-traumatized as a helper. And sharing this is an emotional support among um, uh, all of us. And so we are just trying to communicate with that. And at the next conference, which will take a place in Hamburg, we are inviting Ukrainian psychotherapists to tell us what they think, what we could do in order to care for them in a, in a helpful way. And thirdly, we will receive and modify the established structures for care of traumatized refugees in the so-called refugee crisis 250. I was very much involved there as a, as a uh, as a uh, director of the Sigmund Freud Institute, uh, we have made uh, a model project with, with a scientific evaluation which could help that the politicians had a kind of a, a fig leaf to establish four psychosocial centers which have a stable structure to care for traumatized refugees. Unfortunately, as you just told, the pandemic has also uh, been a tremendous traumatic situation for these refugees in, and also the helpers in these institutions because of the pandemic. And uh, many of these uh, uh, projects have just broken down, but the structures are there and we are trying to revive them and to adapt them to a new situation. Uh, we can discuss it if that is of interest, that it is, of course, a completely different situation than in 2015. The Ukrainians are Europeans. They are they're much closer to us from the history, from the religion, but also from the education. They want to get an apartment as soon as possible to put their children to school, even to go back to their ch country. They don't want to get in a... In a in a situation of, of the, the victim. They want to do something. And I hope that the German politicians have learned something. They gave them the possibility to work right away. You know, the, the, the refugees in 2015, some of them, they don't even have a, a working permission until now, after six years. It's a terrible situation. And it creates a lot of envies in this kind of refugees. But so it is a, a very different situation. And we have, of course, to adapt our psychoanalytic knowledge on coping with trauma to this very new group. And just the last point, uh, of course, we are also trying to do something as, uh, as psychoanalytic researchers. We are supporting a, a research project by Patrick Merce and Tamara Fishman. We are now at the Freud Institute and at the International Psychoanalytic University and, and, and at the University of Kassel, we call it further steps in which we are trying to integrate our own experience, which we had in this psychoanalytic project, we call it Step by Step 2015, and to adapt it to the new situation, but also to learn internationally from all of you, also from you in Peru. And uh, that, is the, uh, that is the, the, the aim of the, res the International Research Committee, and we just had published a book of, of analysts all over the world who are trying to engage in societal crisis, in, with humanitarian crisis, but also with war, but also catastrophes, as you just gave the whole range of, of traumatic societal events. And we are very happy that we also got the bridge now to the Harlem Family Institute with the colleagues around Gil Kleiman, a US American analyst who were so courageous getting involved in very different societal crises after 9-11s, but also when, when Donald Trump, you know, took the children away from the Mexican migrants, he was uh, engaged right away. And I admire his kind of enthusiasm also found it. and he, they their group they developed something very similar as you in Peru they call it workbooks and they were right away trying to translate their workbooks to the to Ukrainian to Poland and to Russian language we are in contact because of course we have to adapt this workbook to the needs in the situation here and we have to do it together with the Ukrainian we cannot kind of imperialistic bring them kind of our ideas. I think that is for me 
the, the best what psychoanalysts can do, that we try to have a, an unconscious dialogue on the same eye level with the traumatized victim and also confront, confront the trauma in us. So just to summarize, I think it seems to be the order of the day that we as psychoanalysts, with our specific knowledge of the unconscious, engage in the care of traumatized refugees and victims of the war, persecution and torture. We try to give language to their embodied memories of the unbearable. Also, of course, we all know and we don't deny that our efforts can only be a drop in the deep ocean of human suffering due to the man-made disasters. Look forward to discuss with you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, all, all three of you. Those were very, very, very interesting uh, presentations. I'd like to open it up now for the three panelists, maybe, to talk among themselves. And uh, after that, we'll turn to take some questions from the audience. But I'm wondering what this has stimulated uh, listening to each other that you might be able to share with us. I have many comments on both of your interventions, but Mariana, would you give me a second to show what I missed? Because it, I think it, it is one of the most powerful tools that we have and we would like to share with, with the audience. Okay, so Matthew, could you please show the booklets <clears throat> I, I, I sent earlier? That, that is it. Uh, our communication secretary developed a series of these booklets that, they, that are very uh, simple in language, very, uh, uh, they, they can go very far. They are very easy to distribute. And they, uh, I think they, they can help people if they have them. Even if people cannot reach them directly, these can reach them. And uh, we have developed a series of them and are willing to write anything that is needed. Um, as you see, well, there, there is uh, some, some practical advice plus uh, recognition of, of feelings, etc. And uh, we have this one for the general population. We have another one for uh, medical workers. We have another one for the police and armed forces that are involved in the, in the care. We have this one for, for the elderly, and we have also one uh, to promote mourning. So uh, I would like, that's it. Uh, okay. Thank you. I, I will give you, thank you. I will give you the, the word, Alex, and then I can, I, I, have, I have things to comment on what you've said. Well, you know, re responding to Pilar and, and Marianne, I, I think we're all speaking to the importance of being able to articulate something that, frankly, is beyond, the, if you will, the, the means of representation of most people. And how do you do that? Uh, and and uh, Pilar, you just gave us some very nice examples. The graphics, uh, uh, Marianne spoke about uh, coloring books and workbooks, which aren't just for the children, but the entire family does that as an exercise together. Whether the family sits on a couch and the child does the picture or the child brings their picture to the parents, it creates an opportunity to, to take pictures, many representations and turn them into words and then and, and share words and share experience. And, and this um, uh, opens up the possibility uh, for growth and healing, uh, transformation. Uh, I got to say, years ago, I worked with Sesame Street uh, for combat veterans, well, the children of combat veterans. And mm -hmm. I came to realize that I probably touched more people through the little bit I did to help articulate the Sesame Street programs than in all the therapy and all the teaching I've ever done for all the articles I've ever written. <laughs> Those more more children, and and what really impressed me uh, is that children pulled their parents into those programs. Uh, I, I think strategies like each of you are sharing are really essential, 
and that analysts have a tremendous amount to bring to those. Yeah, may I say, I think it's, uh, it's so good, you know, to learn from each other that you have these experiences with books, or I would love to read your book from Peru. On the other hand, for me, psychoanalysis is also an attitude to know that, of course, there is danger of getting into activity, you know, that helps us ourselves, not having a kind of to bear the completely um, powerlessness. I mean, we cannot put Putin on the couch. That doesn't, we are, we are so uh, impotent, but I think our profession in contrast to other psychotherapeutic techniques, at least we try, you know, to, to keep attention in us, of course, that having the feeling I have a workbook or I have such or such, or, you know, I had to write a, 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 a program for the politicians, you to say coping with trauma is one, two, three, four, five. I, it needed it and I'm glad I did it. But I, at the same time, I felt so ashamed as a psychoanalyst, as a clinician, knowing that at the same time, it is a defense of not coping with the extreme helplessness, which trauma always is. And I think to have this kind of tension and not to devaluate attempts like having workbooks on the one hand to say, well, that is activism or a, a colleague of me, a, a Polish a second generation colleague, you know, had gone through the show and she said, now the Americans are coming and telling us how to cope with traumatism. She had such an effect against it. And I mean, that is one side, of course, we always as psychoanalysts have to cope with, that we don't kind of deny all these unbearable feelings trauma really is. And I think that is, again and again, it's an attempt of our profession. And it's at the same time, paradoxically, the emotional support we really can give to, to, to traumatized. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Mariane, I have a very committed group of colleagues uh, that are really getting very angry to see the atrocities that are happening. And uh, two, two ideas came up for the IPA, IPA to uh, develop other than standing for the for the victims and giving therapy, etc. Yeah, the first is that the APA as an international important organization that it is, should maybe uh, start promoting the idea that uh, invasions and, and wars are crimes that uh, damage people in every way, but especially in their mental health. So that idea should be put in the minds of politicians. I don't know, the, you know, every, that idea that mental health is, is something that is very damaged and it, it should consider part of the problem any, any time. The second is that any policies that uh, governments or, or international institutions uh, devise for helping, like material help, uh, medical help, uh, educational help, etc., should transversally include the idea of mental health is here also in 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 place and it should be considered that anything you do should have this component taken into account many times it doesn't you go and, and give food to the people but including that uh, in every program i think should be very important and i think the ipa has the power to do that to promote that to lobby i don't know and maybe to get in, in association with other institutions, why not? 
Well, I think we have an administration with Harriet Wolf and also with Ariana who are taking up the, this kind of message. But uh -huh. to be honest, I th at the moment, being confronted with what is happening here in Europe by Putin, all these economical reasons, you know, the, I think the knowledge, what you're saying, at least here in Germany, the politicians, they know that, but they feel extremely helpless. And, you know, they feel ashamed that they have been so naive, you know, making themselves economically extremely dependent on Russia. These are quite different levels of analysis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't want to devaluate, you know, I, I love that uh, Harriet Wolf is so active and Yuck also uh, Virginia Ungar that IPA now wants to, uh, to, to support initiatives. But at the same time, I think uh, Freud was very skeptical. You know, he said that the civilization is really a very thin skin. I think he's right. And to, to, to have this in mind at the same time, I think that is a, a great, great channel challenge for us personally, but also institutionally. Mm -hmm. You know, during World War I, I think psychoanalysts did a remarkable job of showing that they could share ideas and empathize with each other and each other's countries, so populations, not their, not their politics. Uh, despite the war, uh, and even right after the war, when uh, you know, I, I was just rereading, preparing for this Freud's introduction to uh, the book on uh, war neuroses, uh, well, Abraham Frenzy Simmel, and the paper by Ernest Jones. I mean, you know, the war wasn't even over when Jones's paper was being circulated in Germany and, uh, uh, and, and to psychoanalysts all over the world. Analysts can do this. Analysts understand this well. Analysts have international connections that create possibilities that lots of other disciplines don't. We have a question from the audience um, that I would like to bring to you. Um, all the three of you have talked about the need to help the helpers with psychological support, supervision, and information. This makes me think about the importance of also supporting parents and adults in general who may need to talk about war with and protect their children's and adolescents' capacity to think and play. Could you say something more about it? And does it have to do also with the capacity to stay alive and be creative during trauma? I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we in the, the, the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, our medical centers, um, we're seeing thousands of new combat veterans. And the people, and we were hiring thousands of new clinicians. And most of these younger clinicians were not trained psychoanalytically, and they weren't trained in programs that were friendly to psychoanalysis. So they were learning to do trauma therapies in which they thought they could present ideas and formulas and, and, and set to people. And they found themselves being pulled into relationships that were colored by the things we're talking about today. Uh, anxiety, fear, a sense of incompetence, uh, a sense of I can't break through the lack of trust. I, I'm not sure I trust myself anymore. This isn't working. Why did I think I could do this? And um, and, and, and I think um, there are professionals as well as clergy members, uh, local politicians, and I, I like the question, parents, uh, grandparents, uh, who need help, uh, not so much on the couch, but support for their efforts, uh, reassurance that if they feel helpless, crazy, overwhelmed, it's because they're dealing with problems that involve being overwhelmed and helplessness and to a certain extent are insane, that we have to live like this. Um, and, and I think analysts can play a very important role in getting that message out and in that way providing support because we're seen as authorities. If we can share that that vulnerability comes with this territory, 
we can do a great deal of good. Mm -hmm. mm. I agree that parents need taking good care of. Um, there are phenomena that will repeat themselves. But for example, family will be separated. Uh, many of the immigrants are mothers with their children while the, the fathers had to stay to, to fight. Uh, that happens, I think, in every war. Um, and it is different to, it, it is difficult to be a good enough mother in such circumstances when you yourself are traumatized and regressed and you don't have all your resources with you. So I, I think it's paramount that we should take care of parents first. But then there's a psychoanalyst, Moti Benyakar, I don't know if you have heard about him, who uh, rescues the idea that youngsters, children and adolescents have resources and creativity that maybe adults don't have. So uh, if you put adolescents, for example, to solve a problem like how do we do with, uh, with this uh, water problem in this uh, refugee camp? Maybe they come up with uh, ideas that can be very, very, very interesting. So we should rescue that too. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question I would like to ask the three of you. Witnessing over the last months, the response really, you know, throughout the Western world, particularly Europe, because they are the most immediate recipients of these refugees, we can't help but be aware of the discrepancy between the way the Ukrainian refugees are welcomed and the way the refugees from the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world have been treated, which is, you know, really shameful uh, to have to, to think about that difference. And I wonder if you have thoughts about, um, I, I guess, two things. One about maybe the, the difference in, uh, I mean, it's obvious, we respond because they're like us. I mean, that's, this, that's the simple answer. But um, are, do we need to think of different ways of intervening and being available and helpful when refugees are the others? Um, and what's the countertransference that we have to be thoughtful about when we think about how we as analysts uh, respond to these crises? Because it, obviously this isn't the last one. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very important question and on very different levels. I mean, in, in Germany, to be very concrete, I'm still working as an analyst with refugees who came here 2015-16. And one of these refugees really, really, uh, nearly became psychotic because he couldn't cope the envy, you know, that the society is so in just having two classes of refugee. And I mean, as these traumatized people are, they are seismographic, they are so warm, and he's right to the point. I mean, uh, he is right. It is unjust and we have to reflect it. And I think that is another challenge. I think psychoanalysis is a discipline which tries to reflect in a very radical sense, you know, about the, 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 the latent issue of racism, of threat, you know, the whole psychodynamic being confronted with the foreigner, really the foreigner from the Middle East. That was one of the of the most challenging issues working with the refugees in 2015, and it was really not not easy. And the integration problems of this kind of refugees, you know, coming from a really foreign culture, it, I mean, it's still a tension we have in the society. And I think uh, at least, you know, I'm coming. I'm a 68. Uh, uh, child of the 68 uh, time, you know, where I don't want to devaluate. I'm very grateful for all the experience, you know, when we thought we can do the, the, we can change the world and do the revolution, but it was also a very narcissistic kind of time, you know, and we idealized psychoanalysis. It was a self-idealization of what psychoanalysis can do. We can change the world, at least in Zurich, where I'm coming, I'm Swiss, you know. 
and I, I feel very personally very ashamed, you know, that we as Swiss, a small, very privileged, very capitalistic kind of little country, very privileged, we didn't have the war, the Second World War, you know, and we had the grandiosity fantasy that we can make the revolution. I mean, I'm still very ashamed of it, yeah? But I think I personally had to learn, and I, I think many of my generation, that we need the dialogue, for instance, with politics scientists, with economists, and without devaluating what we, we, the specificity of what we can offer as psychoanalysts. But it is small. It's, it's really a drop in, in the large ocean of knowledge. And I think your question, that's why I think we, we could contribute to a culture of care and reflection. Why did we treat the Africans? I mean, that is terrible, you know, thousands of African refugees are drowning in, in the medieval sea each day. That, uh, and we shouldn't forget it and we should reflect in a very painful way as psychoanalysts do. Why is it so? Why can't we cope with, uh, with this kind of danger which the foreigner is for us all and, and our culture? Sorry, my English is not good enough, but it's just a, a very complex issue. Yeah. Um, unless somebody else wants to respond to that, we have an, some, uh, some other audience questions. Well, very quickly, one thought I had as a reaction to what, what's been said is, you know, if we were to look to refugees for their creativity, if we were to partner with them and finding, solving their problems, this is what you learn from global health. You know, it's not like the, 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 the people go into uh, third world countries and in a colonial sense and, 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 and civilize them. Global health, you often you learn things that you needed back in the first world country. From the third world country, they do it better than you do. And I think if we were to have that attitude to our refugees, uh, we would be supporting their coping as opposed to turning them into objects to be stored on a shelf somewhere. Yes. Actually, that leads beautifully into two more questions from the audience that I think you are just beginning to touch on. And, uh, one is how to work with counter-transference in the clinic with war traumatic experiences and how it affects the therapeutic process. And a third question, which I think these two go together, how this analytic work with the refugees can enrich psychoanalysis? Mm -hmm. Very good question. I think we are... Well, I <laughs> I, I think counter-transference phenomenon, transference and counter-transference phenomenon in, in these kind of interventions have to be put on the table. You cannot hide them and pretend that they don't exist, including racism, for example, cultural differences, economic differences between the help and the helper. It, they have to be put on the table because otherwise the processes won't go through. Um, uh, I think we have lots of things to learn from the experience of helping refugees and other victims. Lots of things to learn. Psychoanalysis cannot be that enriched uh, with this as long as we are able to elaborate uh, on them. And I, I wanted to say something else uh, about the, the previous uh, question on racism. I think uh, we, we always have the good intentions that racism can be, be overcome and every, everybody will love everybody someday. Well, uh, I think we have to, uh, to think about the historical uh, roots of racism, and we cannot forget them ever, but also the unconscious roots of racism. Uh, uh, that some analysts ha have uh, worked very extensively about that, and maybe maybe we should uh, study them more deeply and uh, see what they can offer us. For example, the need to have enemies mm -hmm. uh, as well as as allies, you know, allies and enemies, um, and what we deposit on anyone that's different to us, etc. It to be to be short. 
Mm -hmm. Would either of uh, Harold or Marianne, would you like to add anything about what we have to learn? Well, I I wanted to be so short. I think I'm very glad that the psychoanalytic institution have made a change. That we became. It seems to me that we have become more curious on each other and the, on the engagement we are doing in the different world. With I, I think without denying the helplessness and uh, the need to, to be very humble and to learn from the refugees. I think there is a development there, but I think we have also learned a lot uh, from a technical point of view. There have been several uh, large debates about how to cope with traumatized, you know, I just remember one, you know, with uh, my husband has had with Peter Fonagy about the, the the issue uh, how important is historical reality for the traumatized i mean it was a very important debate for my feeling yeah and i think mm -hmm. we have knowledge now that we don't just rationalize or intellectualize if we help the traumatized to understand what really happened also in the external reality and how that was kind of mixed and confused with his unconscious fantasies and so on, that it is not the polarity, but it has, has to be considered from both sides. So I think we are on the way and we have learned that from the victims and we learn a lot from the refugees. I mean, that uh, that is uh, just me personally being so over flooded with this responsibility. I don't want to idealize. I had bad sleeps at that time too. It was such an overtaxing, but I have learned so much of these people and I admire them, the people coming from Africa, what they had gone through. It's enormous. I don't want to idealize it, but I have learned a lot from them for their vitality, their resilience, their optimism in life. And that is on a very personal level, I think also as an analyst, but even also uh, politically, just one remark, I just ha had heard a, a, a report in the newspaper that the country who does the best job with refugees is Uganda, it's an African country, mm. who gives, gives land to every refugee who's coming and gives them a possibility to, to do their own things. I mean, at one point, it's another issue, but I think we can also learn from from countries like in Africa, how they are coping with the refugee problem. It's not just a one-way communication, yeah. Mm -hmm. Marianne, I have a, a, a message here from a colleague that would like to get in touch with you because uh, we are having now a, a refugee crisis from Venezuela that have come to Peru mm -hmm. and uh, they, they have very very many difficulties uh, adapting to our society and they are very much rejected but they are very similar to us the latin americans like us and in other times many peruvians went to venezuela as refugees so there's a lot of i, I will put you in contact with her okay so I, I had the privilege to be in exchange with some of your colleagues in London. That's the advantage of the IPA here. Yeah? But I, and I was invited to South America. I know the Venezuela problem is it's huge. Mm -hmm. Forget mm -hmm. about it. And uh, well, I'm happy if we can make such bridges and be in exchange. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I'd add very, very concretely that Group supervision, I think, is very important uh, uh, as a support for the people doing this work to share concerns and fantasies and memories and free associations in a safe group. Yeah. I also think that identifying the helpers within the communities we serve, whether it's a refugee community uh, or it's communities on the ground, uh, it, it, it's very important because we get to learn about culture from them. And we often need that help. We don't know how we're being perceived. We don't know if our ideas uh, really uh, are welcomed or helpful or what we could do to make them more welcome and more helpful. I think that lesson was learned in Rwanda when many 
do-gooders uh, and, and, and sincere, skilled people. Winter Rwanda will bring Western ideas and, and concepts. And the Rwandas in those days were kind of like, well, that's not the way we think about this. That's not how we get better here. Thank you for coming. You know, uh, you know, but but uh, I, I think it's so important to truly respect other cultures and learn from them and see yourself always learning. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, here is a fourth question, which I think plays off of what uh, Harold was just saying. It's not exactly the same thing, but what is your view of group settings in trauma situations? Um, and would you say something about the use of this setting in the different moments of a war, for example, while the war and the trauma is unfolding or after the war is over? And I think Harold was just speaking to the importance of understanding the group context of the individual refugee that you're dealing with. That we, you know, psychoanalysis is so focused on the individual, and we really have to think about the individual within their group and their social context. But um, I'm sorry, I, shall I read the question again? No, no, <laughs> no. It, you know, let me just jump back in. And, and, and in creating clinical practice guidelines for traumatic stress, uh, and there are several very good ones, uh, the one the VA and Department of Defense did, but uh, in the United States, but the International Society for Traumatic Stress, which pulls together things from the British system, from many, many countries, uh, the one of the only contraindications was something called a uh, critical incident uh, stress debriefing. And the literature on it's interesting because for several years, everyone thought this is the answer. Get groups together, psychoeducation opportunities to share their experiences, to share what their thoughts were about their experience, and this would help. But in fact, it actually re-traumatized some people. Uh, but I think if you really look deeply into that literature, what you see is if you get people who come from different aspects of the trauma, who don't know each other, who aren't already a cohesive group, and you get them to tell each other their problems, you actually make, you can make things worse and deepen that sense of we're falling down into the whirlpool. If they're a very cohesive group, if they're a group that shared the experiences, it, it can be helpful. Uh, so groups can be helpful. I think they can be hurtful. I think you have to know the group. You have to pick the right group. <laughs> you have to trust them to tell you if they're the right group. And you have to proceed cautiously. I, I would very much underline what you said. Well, we had in this first in, uh, reception camp, we had offers for groups, for mothers and babies, for adolescents, for children and painting groups for, for children, but we had also individual consultation hours. And I think that we, we left it up to the refugees also. I think they, most of them had a very good feeling what they needed. And sometimes it was really so what you said, that the group setting, the social control for some of the people coming from Muslim complex, the, the social control of each other was very high and also to talk about trauma would be uh, 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 received as a lot of shame, anxieties and sometimes also a re-traumatization kind of thing. And so I, mm -hmm. I think we as analysts we don't have reset recipes, we have just our empathy to, to learn from each other, to learn from the refugees, to take them serious, that sometimes they know best what really can help them. And uh, yeah, how, how you started by, by saying that it is important to diagnose any situation. Not everything works for everyone. So the, the context and the characteristics of a particular group you're working with are very important to take into account. And also another idea that uh, I need to, to point out is uh, the idea that the perpetrators are also victims and traumatized. Many times they're forcefully uh, obliged to kill other people and to witness terrible things. So we shouldn't forget them either. Uh, 
We have one last, uh, I, I'm going to read quickly a comment. I'm not sure that we're really going to have time for the question part, but let me, uh, let me read the comment. Many thanks and congratulations to all of you for this beautiful panel. Namely, I fully agree with Marianne lutzinger Bolabo's subtle analysis of how important and difficult it is to keep our own psychoanalytic competencies um, uh, uh, in mind as we try to help these victims um, and to fully accept to be a transference object with severely traumatized people as Harold Kudler reminded us. Um, we are just about uh, out of time and uh, I just wanted to thank all three of you for a, a wonderful, wonderful conversation. It seems to me that um, we have all been left with uh, as many questions as uh, answers that we've gotten from you, and maybe the questions are more important. Well, no, the answers are important too, but the questions are very important that we walk away with. Um, we're sorry that we are unable to, uh, to pose all of the questions that the audience and participants have asked, and um, I hope that we at least um, the ones we did get to were certainly helped to enrich the conversation. Um, I want to call your attention to uh, the LinkedIn discussion group. Uh, I think you see it as a slide on your on your screen, and uh, everybody is welcome to uh, participate in that and join. And uh, we have a next webinar to, uh, to announce, an upcoming webinar, webinar uh, psycho, Psychoanalysis, sorry, I'm not an Italian, El Sonido y el Silencio, uh, on May 26th from 16 o'clock to 7.30 British Standard Time. And uh, uh, the conversation continues. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.